Milton, do you want to come up? Hi, welcome everybody. Um, this is going to be a very special event today. I can't tell you how long and tortuous a journey it has been to get this book into the public sphere. Um, but I'm very excited that it is, and we'll talk to you about that in a bit later. But first, Realton's going to read a poem. Um, and it's a poem that connects to what we're going to talk about, um, but from a different space, from something that was going on in Ireland, where people were beginning to talk about child sexual abuse, when people were beginning to talk about it here. So, okay, um, thank you. And it's from Maggie Gibson, brought out a collection, an anthology a fortnight ago. I came over for that, because I was in it. And uh, they said to me, and you know, if, um, Philly of people, hello. Uh, so, do you want to come over in a fortnight? And we'll, we'll slot you in somewhere. And I would like to thank Bia and Liz very much for allowing me to muscle in for a few moments before they start. And thank you very much, it is important. This is called Breast, and it is in memory of a, of a child called Anne Lovett, who was 14 when she died in 1984. And she died in a grotto in front of a statue of the Virgin Mary in a churchyard. Did the baby Jesus have difficulty latching onto his mother's breast? Did they both cry with frustration? Did she get mastitis with all the stress? Unexpectedly pregnant and the contempt in Joseph's eyes on the way to Bethlehem and the neighbor's gossip on the altar, a man who never, ever leaked milk down his mass garments, who never lay in a salt bath to heal his sore nipples, whose crotch was never torn to ease the birth, never had a suppository nor pessary, nor even castor oil, bloodless, sweat-free, no tears. He stands there, reading from the book of the birth of the child Jesus. I don't think of Anne, Mary's mother, from my seat at the back of the chapel, but of the other Anne, who died a lonely, fearful death, destroyed. No shelter, no sanctuary, at the feet of the Virgin in Longford. The connections will become clear a bit later uh, between the poem and what B has to say. We thought we'd start off by um, saying something about the journey to the two of us being sat here on the stage together. I first encountered B in, I think, 1973, 74. I went to the Communist University and she was doing a series on feminism. And I was mesmerized by her voice and her words, as I still am. Um, but I was very clear that she was defining herself as a communist and I was a radical feminist. And so it felt like there was this big gulf between us. And then somehow, both of us arrived at the issue of child sexual abuse. And it became a bridge, a very important bridge. And I have loved thinking with her, spending time with her ever since. And she was doing her work as a journalist about Cleveland. And I was organizing with a group of women to critique the report when it came out. And I tried to find a copy of our report in our uh, filing system at work and I couldn't. But we were called the Feminist Coalition Against Child Sexual Abuse and we published a critique of the report at the same time as B was working on her critique. So this is why we're here together. And um, this, this book is a revisiting of unofficial secrets. Um, it's still the book that I teach um, with students. And I've been telling them for the last three years that there's going to be a new version. There's going to be a new version. And it got delayed and delayed for reasons B may choose to tell you about or she may not. 
Um, do you want to say about how you come to be sat in this chair? It's a funny thing to, to recall those days in the, in the early 70s when being a communist, I have to confess to really enjoying sectarianism and schisms <laughs> and splits. I think probably, as my beloved Judith would say, to this day. However, one of the things that's so brilliant about feminism is that even though we had to navigate currents and waves and bust-ups, and indeed many lost friendships across those schisms and splits in feminism, the wonderful thing about it is that now I feel they're completely irrelevant. And, there's been, and one of the reasons for that, I think, is the extraordinary resilience of those women who identified almost immediately that violence and sexual abuse were at the core of the question of patriarchy. And it was something that socialist hyphen, I was never a hyphen, I have to tell you, <laughs> feminists were slow to appreciate, and some, I think, still don't. They don't appreciate the necessary connection between institutions, structures, cultures, and crucially, the bodies of women as the scene of patriarchal crime. And that's one of the things that I think radical feminism has to be honored for, because it always understood that. And it was always... <laughs> it was always interested in the excavation of what that really meant, how it was lived in bodies, in cultures, in politics, in criminal justice systems. But it started with that visceral appreciation of women's bodies as, the, the, as it were, the origin, the site of patriarchal power. So for that, I'm very grateful and routinely accused of being really underneath it all a rad femme, <laughs> like, uh, I like, like many of you. So what our relationship then became in that moment that you've described was one that I have to tell you is characterized by me ringing up Liz and saying, Liz, can you help me think about this? Or tell me what you know about this? Because there, across these decades since that time, scandal after scandal, flank after flank, oceans opening, being revealed, new themes to do with sexual politics that Liz, Liz, Liz's politics and Liz's work and her research keeps on being in. And that's why, and we're all very familiar with this, as uh, those of us, a few of us here, who were of a certain age, <laughs> have become familiar with this thing, which is one of the great exciting things about feminism, is she doesn't stop, you don't know it all, you have to start again and think again and, and find stuff out that you didn't know you needed to know. So that's where our relationship thrives. Yes. yes. Okay, so I want to start off by asking who, have, which of you know about Cleveland? Okay. What do you think you know? Anybody? Okay, you think it's a cover-up. Anyone think that they know something different? Right. That's what most people think they know about Cleveland. That actually lots of children had terrible things happen to them and actually nothing terrible had happened to them before. And that's the story that I think we all inherited from the report. Actually, the report says very clearly it is not telling us whether those women were abused or not. Sorry, children were abused or not. They weren't all women. Um, but that's got forgotten. So there's a story now, a public story, that all the professionals were wrong. None of the children were abused. And what was the worst thing about it was that social workers and the police didn't talk to one another. That was the worst thing that happened. 
And that's the story that B started to excavate, excavate um, and one that she's gone back to, and she has revelations for us, don't you? So I think you should go and do your thing. It would be better, really, if I could sit with Liz and chat, but I need to have my hands, and I can't be holding one of those things at the same time as talking. I can only do one thing at a time, unusually for women. Okay, I want to start with the context in which this explosion happened in Britain in 1987 that commanded more column inches than any other single issue that year. And one of the things that was bizarre about it was that it concerned what were regarded as very odd, abstruse, technical, medical conversations. I want to not focus on that yet. I want to just describe why that thing happened when it happened. It happened in the 1980s because the women's liberation movement had already happened and transformed what could be known about sexual abuse men's sexual interest in children, rape, and sexual abuse generally, and domestic violence generally. So public awareness was being transformed in what, what was, without any doubt, a cultural revolution ignited by the women's liberation movement. And of course, it was a movement of activists, scholars, survivors, people who were suffering, and their partners, sometimes in the professions, and it yielded a new archive of knowledge about what sex was, where it happened, who did what to who, and what rape was, and what child sexual abuse was. And why those two latter bits were so radical, because what they revealed was that women didn't really know how to account for what was happening to them. So this was revolutionary research that challenged everything that was then known. It wasn't that actually it had never been known. The history of all of this is that it comes and goes, it ebbs and flows, stuff gets known, stuff is shared between women that is periodically allowed to surface and then doesn't just disappear but is defeated. And so this moment, in the 1980s was another of those great moments. I call it the, uh, an era of enlightenment when the, the, the knowledge of professionals who were researching this stuff, many of them involved in the childcare professions, pediatrics, child welfare, all of that, some of them sociological researchers who became partners, so to say, with a women's liberation movement that was centrally interested in the significance of rape and sexual abuse. Not as kind of accidents of excessive desire or idiosyncratic desire, but as strategic activities. So that's the context in which, in a county in England in 1987, there was a kind of bomb dropped into that conversation. And one of the things that, that a kind of aching sentence in that report that you described is the authors of the preface say, we expected a backlash, but we thought we had more time. We thought we had more time. We didn't. No sooner had the institutions been given a mandate to intervene on suspicion of harm, and for the first time it was specified, sexual harm to children, they had no alternative but to intervene. That was their statutory duty. And all over Britain, and elsewhere, elsewhere too, but all over Britain, professionals, some of them are gonna be in this room, Professionals abided by that mandate. They honoured the mandate. They did something. If a child's body 
was telling a story, either because it was failing to thrive, and it's five, and it's sad, and children who are five aren't sad if they live you know, in one of these, one of the most, one of the richest countries in the world, where everybody's supposed to be happy. Okay, so they were, their, their project was to identify children who were one way or another suffering. And in that context, paediatricians were researching how that could be read on the bodies of children. And uniquely in Britain, paediatricians in Leeds, where there was a well-established well collegial context between uh, survivors of sexual abuse, police officers, paediatricians, social services professionals identified signs on the bodies of children, very young children, sometimes preschoolers, that announced chronic, regular, undiscovered rape and sodomy. Children who had not been able to tell the story, had not volunteered the story, rather, until they were asked, and some of them were then able to say, when asked, what's been happening? They were able to say, what's been happening? And who'd done it? And these paediatricians wrote up their research, and it transformed the lexicon of knowledge available to people whose job it was to take care of children. Okay, so all, all across the country, uh, new collegial contexts were being created for professionals to share knowledge and to share their thinking about what was to be done. Unbeknownst to them, the moment of the declaration of this new mandate happened in 1986. There was a codicil to the government circular announcing this new duty. Bear in mind, this was happening in the wake of a trail of child deaths that alarmed our society and really gave professionals a warning. Don't you dare not do anything. Thou shalt intervene. Okay, so that was branded on their consciousness. And in lots of places, there were decent enough relationships between the professionals and, crucially, Women's Liberation Movement organisations, rape crisis centres, women's aid, professionals who were working with those self-help survivor movements. Okay, so that the context, the professional context, is really crucial to understand. Unfortunately, in Cleveland, the police habitually refused to take part in those collegial contexts. They did not like working with rape crisis or women's aid. In fact, they didn't like working with women. What they did like was working with men and banging up boys and trailing stolen cars. They liked man crime. What they hadn't connected, of course, was that this is absolutely, irreducibly man crime. It's about them and the culture that they're created by. But anyway, okay, so what happened in Cleveland was that paediatricians at Middlesbrough General Hospital read the new research, were being referred children. The cohort that we're talking about is 121 children out of a child population of some hundreds of thousands, a couple of hundred thousand. And these were children who'd worried somebody for a long time. And what they did was just look. They looked everywhere on the bodies of these children who were telling a story in the absence of the child being able to speak a story very often. And that's, in a way, why the medical evidence was so important in this. Because, of course, we're talking about a landscape, the body as a landscape of signs and symptoms of stories that people can't tell, either because they can't tell them, because they're toddlers, or because they don't know what it is. I don't know what appendicitis is, so I couldn't tell you that I've got it. So their job was to interpret what they witnessed in the bodies of these children. 
And what they witnessed were very dramatic signs of chronic penetration in children whose average age was eight. Instantly, the police refused to believe it. They hadn't read the new research, which I have to, I have to say was, uh, was also relying on research that had been well established for more than 100 years, identified by the great French forensic pathologist uh, Ambroise Tardieu, who, became, who was a legend in France, and some of that literature uh, carried over here and was understood, and appeared in the forensic pathology, sorry for the pronunciation, uh, it appeared in the forensic pathology textbooks that were quite familiar to police surgeons. However, in Cleveland, they weren't. They hadn't read their own manuals. Worse, they were having to cooperate with what they regarded as stroppy women. Worse, they were stroppy women who knew more than they did. <laughs> Actually, the women weren't stroppy. They were like you. They were nice. They were absolutely committed to participating in relationships that could read the drama of these children's lives and do something sensible about it to stop it. That's all they were. Okay, so there's a crisis. And the police go public, they engage with politicians who, like them, knew nothing about what was being identified in children who had been frequent visitors to the hospital with something that was troubling but unresolved. So do you get the picture of the, the cohort and the context of the Cleveland crisis? Almost immediately, the government was faced with this really very serious dilemma because it dispatched its own professionals to Cleveland to check out, were these people mad or were they doing their jobs? And what the government was told up until the July of 1987 was actually they weren't mad and they were doing their jobs. And what they were seeing was being seen everywhere. From 1986 and that new mandate, in less than a year, the rate of referral of children to the statutory services who were suspected of being sexually abused rose by hundreds of percent. The Department of Health was informed <coughs> hundreds of percent, so there was nothing unusual about what was going on in Cleveland. What was unusual, well, it wasn't unusual, but what was unfortunate was that the, uh, that the, the professionals felt uh, that they had a duty to intervene, but how could they intervene without an investigation? Who were these children to be protected from? If the police didn't investigate, how was anybody to know? What was anybody to do? That was one of the cruxes of the crisis. It didn't, in the end, become the critical one because almost immediately the, the government decided that, mm, well, actually, the government was, was somewhat divided. It had different kinds of pressures. And the Secretary of State for Health and Social Services happened to be somebody who didn't know about sexual abuse, wasn't interested in sexual abuse, but was interested very much in the privatisation of public services. He's dead now. He's called John Moore, late and unlamented. He was absolutely determined. This has got to stop. Because the other, part, the other sentence at the end of that codicil that I mentioned earlier, thou shalt do something about sexual abuse, had another little couple of lines that said, but there will be no new resources. So imagine you've got a situation where the rate of referral of children hitherto unseen, unread, not understood, happens to public services who have got no new resources. It's bound to be a crisis. It was a crisis. In most places, people managed. In Cleveland, it was catastrophic. Because, of course, there was an advocate, a bunch of advocates, who were saying, this is not happening. So the government calls an inquiry and the, 
the, the thing that struck me at the time, or what I thought at the time, was that this is an inquiry that was designed to not ask or answer the question on everybody's lips. Were these children abused? The person who chaired the inquiry, Elizabeth Butler Sloss, who became a lord, Elizabeth Butler Sloss, until the times changed enough for her to become known as Lady, was it, or Dame? Lady. She's a lady. She always says, you know, I wasn't asked to ask that question. So she didn't ask. And she always says that she didn't know. I always assumed, I wrote about it at the time, I always assumed that, that this inquiry was an inquiry that was designed to not know. Then I was forced to change my mind. So the research that Liz has referred to, it began with a brown envelope that plopped into my letterbox about 10 years after the Cleveland inquiry that remains to this day secret. And it was a report sent by the regional health authority that employed the doctors involved in the controversy uh, to the Department of Health that said in the pages after page 13 of this secret report that it was generally believed by the independent experts who examined the children that the doctor's diagnosis was correct in around 75% of the cases. When I first asked for that report, well, because I got it, um, but I asked the Department of Health um, to confirm its existence. A 13-year-old person in the press office said it didn't exist. <laughs> and to be honest, I couldn't blame them because they were 13 and it was a long time ago. But when I said, uh, but it does because I've got it, and they couldn't find it anyway. And so then, you know, um, I put in a request at the... Uh, National Archives for said document and it never appeared for quite a, a, a number of years and then probably about four years ago it appeared but all of the pages after page 13 which are the pages that contain the discussion of 75% correct had been redacted and they remain redacted. Then, another thing happened. This was a, a result of the 30-year rule. A little file appears in the vast Cleveland cache of documents at the National Archive. Thank God for public libraries, I have to say. Um, and it's a skinny little file, a different colour from all the other ones. And it's the Lord, it's the Chancellor of the Exchequer's file. That's what, it, that's what it's entitled. And I thought to myself, why is that there? What's the Treasury and the Chancellor of the Exchequer got to do with all of this? So it was thin. I have a little look into it. And it's fascinating. Because, and here I've got a little copy. I've become like an old lady who has bits of paper all over my bag, and, but these little, this, you can't read it, but I'm gonna tell you what's in it. This is treasure. And it fell into the Chancellor of the Exchequer's file, and I want to tell you what's in it, and I'm gonna read it, but not on, off this because it's too small. And what it says, um, I'm gonna tell you in a second, it's part of a discussion that took place in June and July of 1988. Just as Elizabeth Butler Sloss's report was to be presented to Parliament. And the Cabinet is very exercised by this report. Because it doesn't say that there was a mass miscarriage of justice. But it doesn't really say very much at all about the medical evidence and the medical contest at the heart of the controversy. Except it does say this, we have no reason to doubt the medical findings of, and then it names the two pediatricians 
at the heart of the controversy, Marietta Higgs and Jeff Wyatt. These words, we have no reason to doubt their medical, their clinical findings. That you will find in the Cleveland report, which everybody who read it at the time could have seen. Never referred to routinely. So the cabinet have been reminded of this and they're, they're upset about it because what they're really interested in is miscarriages of justice. Innocent parents being accused. What it then goes on to say, these, I'm going to now tell you what's in this very precious little document. Um, it refers to the anxious discussions in the cabinet and Margaret Thatcher's view, which was that she wanted miscarriages of justice and parents being accused wrongly to be stressed. And it says, uh, whether or not children were abused um, hadn't been... Uh, hadn't been assessed in the Cleveland report. So there are no figures, nothing. And what this little letter says is, this is dangerous territory for us to get into. Repeat, this is dangerous territory for us to get into. But the Sloss was very careful not to make any comment on the correctness or otherwise of the diagnosis. The DHS have told us, however, that independent medical assessment has been made of the diagnoses of sexual abuse. They were correct in at least 80% of the 121 cases. Comments in this area are unlikely, sorry, comments in this area are likely to be turned back on us later as bids for extra expenditure. I suggest, therefore, says the Treasury official, that, and then blether, 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 talk about something else. And so that's exactly what the minister did when he introduced the Cleveland report into Parliament the next day. This was written on the 5th of July, and on the 6th of July, the report goes to Parliament, and it never mentions what had become the established consensus amongst medical experts who had anything to do with the Cleveland controversy, which was that there was a higher than average and a higher than expected rate of diagnostic accuracy. So we hit something that we've become increasingly familiar with. It's called a cover-up. People get very worried in publishing and wherever about saying it's a cover-up, but I don't know what else you call it. <coughs> if you decide that at least 80% of children in a small cohort have been grossly sexually abused, who are the subjects of a major national controversy, but we are not going to reveal it. We're going to keep a secret. And it has remained a secret thereafter. That, I think, is a cover-up. Now, I want to begin to wrap up a bit by saying, like, what, does, what, what are the implications of that? Well, first, obviously, we have all been misled. And one of the reasons that's important is because even though we all expect to be misled, ministers have an obligation, it's called uh, a constitutional convention that's written up in paragraph 27 of questions for, of procedure for ministers. It's been revised many, many times, but paragraph 27 remains as the, as it were, biblical paragraph that all ministers get that is about telling the truth that is about what they share with the public. So the decision to not share that crucial piece of information about doctors' discovery of hitherto unidentified acts of rape perpetrated against children whose average age was eight, half of whom were able to say who'd done it, 
and half of whom approximately couldn't say or wouldn't say who'd done it. That really vital piece of information has been kept from us ever since. In a practice that is a, an explicit breach of their constitutional duty. And it was the same kind of practice was described in the Scott Report. Do you remember the Scott Report into illegal arms sales in the 1990s? The Scott Report describes that kind of suppression and secrecy as determinedly and designedly misleading the public and leading to, quotes, this is what Sir Richard Scott said, debate without, public debate without knowledge. And that seems to me to be a precise description of the history of the Cleveland controversy and the response to it by the government ever since. So it's both an atrocity in terms of what could be known, a transformative discovery about children's experience of abuse, but it's also an assault on democracy, on our right to know stuff that enables us to make demands of our services and political systems that would make a difference, that might be transformative. And there's a final thing that, that shadows this whole political conversation, and that is these children. Who were they? 121. Who were they? What were their lives like? What really happened to them? We don't know. And the reason we don't know is because there was a designed and determined decision to not know. The children were never followed up. Imagine that you'd had, I don't know, a colliery disaster, a blood transfusion disaster, and there'd be no follow-up of the survivors, no curiosity, no interest in where they were, what happened when they went home. The only fact that we were... Um, actually allowed to have the only numbers that are quoted in the Cleveland report, which have been endlessly recycled, are 98 of those 121 children are now at home. What did that mean? And what were we supposed to infer from that? That the abuse never happened? Well, that's what the press inferred. And I put this to Elizabeth Butler-Sloss, who was very genial, um, and so, you know, well, people inferred that the abuse had never happened. Oh, no, 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 that's not what, not what we meant at all, she said. But whether she meant it or not, what she certainly meant was that though that, that, that medical strategy, be as she put it, um, be kept off stage. And so that that... that that way of maybe getting at a catastrophe that's happened to some children would just be abandoned. And for a couple of decades after that, it was assumed that the medical diagnosis of this gro gross activity uh, was indeed kept off stage. But in 2014, internationally, uh, there was a review of the evidence of in signs of anal abuse in childhood, which finally confirmed that if you see that constellation of signs that were seen in Cleveland, it would be a dereliction of duty to not infer the possibility of sexual abuse. So the signs have been vindicated. It makes no difference, however, because that new knowledge has not been allowed to, so to say, penetrate, to infuse contemporary thinking about sexual abuse. And we don't have an answer from the children who that happened to because they haven't spoken. They weren't asked, they weren't talked to, they weren't followed up. An astounding level of institutional indifference to these children who've been the subject of such intense debate. Fewer than half a dozen of them have come forward to tell their story. So far, 
of that half dozen, all of them, except one, all of them have been children who had not had access to their personal records. They were children who lived with, whose lives were described by that national narrative. It never happened. It never happened. But one has come forward to tell her story. And I urge you to read her story. She's called Minnie in the book, Secrets and Silence, because it's a most... I just want to cry every time I read it. Partly because it's a very eloquent and precise account of a child's experience of a childhood in hell. It's also uttered with that extraordinary eloquence that often survivors of hell manage to muster to describe their experiences. She's one of them. I just think she's a poet. Now, what she's able to say is... I think, you know, well, she tells a story that has never been told. And what she says is, she can remember the day that she was in hospital and she was examined by Dr. Marietta Higgs, who was, at the time that this child met Marietta Higgs, the most hated woman in England. That's how she was described. And this woman, Minnie says, Yes, she was described as a bad, bad person in my family and everywhere, but to me, she was my saviour. And she remembers her. She remembers her interpretation of her own body. She remembers clean sheets. She remembers hospital as being not, you know, a concentration camp, as it was represented at the time, but as nice, and people were nice. And people took her to get her teeth brushed and held her hand and didn't knock her about and didn't rape her. Almost instantly, within a month, she lost Dr. Marietta Higgs because the public inquiry was announced and Marietta Higgs was no longer allowed to work with those patients in Middlesbrough General or on sexual abuse at all thereafter. Banned. This child is very eloquent, very clear about what was her strategy at the time. She said, I never spoke. I was silent because there would always be bedlam if I spoke, if I said anything. But she had a brother, an older brother, who was also being sadistically sexually abused, and he didn't stop talking. In fact, it was him who raised the alarm about what was going on in their family. He didn't stop talking. And it didn't make any difference. They were protected. They were brought to the attention of, by now, social services who understood their mandate. But there was no prosecution. There was no justice. No acknowledgement in their family or in their community that these children had been heralds who tried to call a halt to a campaign of abuse. Nothing. Until now. This woman has told her story. And the project, I think, for us, who are interested in that story, and we can talk about this if we've got time, the project for us is to how to make that story matter. How to make that story make a difference. Because as she puts it, I've got, I've got this fire in me, and it won't go out. Well, our task, I think, is to make sure that the burning doesn't stop with her to make her story matter in a way that it was never allowed to. And this raises a final thing for us to, to think about. We're all, we're all activists, that's why we're here. We believe that, that, the, that the activity of politics is the irreducible element of making a difference. Telling a story is one thing. Making the story make a difference is another thing. The knowledge of atrocities perpetrated by men on the bodies of children 
been told probably forever. So now is the moment, yet again, another now, when how the making of the difference, how to make that knowledge transform everyday life is the invitation often by Minnie, the only person who's gone public of all those children. It's extraordinary, isn't it? To make sure that that story is told. So I'll leave you there with that thought. Thank you for listening. I'm afraid I'm going to have to give you this. I'm sorry. Um, you all right? Okay. You didn't really tell us that much, though, about the terrible struggle about the book and the ways in which the publishers did not want to know in a different way, what happened to the children? Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Well, Liz has hit on something which I think is, is probably historic, but also has a contemporary resonance that we're all familiar with. When I was doing this, this book again, I'm thinking about Minnie's story in particular, and about my relationship to hearing these things and my relationship to this kind of knowledge. It was quite a challenge, because what I realized was that the engagement with it in 1987 was an engagement with arguments about institutions and theories and what you know, X group of professionals did or didn't do and what politicians said and didn't say. Um, I do remember reading an inventory about a particular uh, child, and it was stupid. I was reading it, you know, as part of a, a list of stuff, and I was reading it in bed. And, and I found myself weeping because of what the, the coded information might have meant. But it did remind me that the doing of that piece of work then in 1987 and 1988, which largely, largely concerned with impersonal processes and procedures and political warfare. This time round, I felt very differently about it, partly because I'm different, we're all different, and a sense of uh, the weight of all of this harm. Telling the truth, it was a cover-up, these are the details of what happened to these children, is really decisive. It helps us understand why this thing is so important and why it's like other things. It's why it's like, you know, lying about selling arms to a dictator is important because the consequences for the bodies of humans are unspeakable. And, of course, the, the culture that we live in is one that... Silos, arms trade is one thing, celebrities another thing, Jimmy Savile's another thing, dolls another thing. Things that are not allowed to, you know, crunch up against each other and help us to make sense of what our institutional culture is. So this is a very early example yeah. of something that is now conventionally understood as a degraded public culture. Yeah. One other thing I want to ask before we... about the connection between the poem yeah. and Cleveland. Yeah. yeah. At the same time, we're talking about the 1980s, there was... Ireland was extraordinary. It is extraordinary now, again. 
But it was extraordinary because there were these hugely scandalous, awful revelations of, like the death of Anne Lovett, giving birth as a kid in a churchyard on her own. Whose baby was that? Who made that happen? Who knew that she was pregnant? Why was she left bleeding to death in a churchyard? That arrested Irish political culture at the time. There were several other major scandals, the Kerry Baby scandal, uh, sexual, sexual crime, sex, bodies, was on the political agenda in Ireland in a way that was absolutely unprecedented. Unprecedented, because this was a society, remember, that's obsessed with bodies and hems and ankles and what can be seen and what can be said, and we all know. But the thing about those events and the Anne Lovett was that they revealed the consequences of the hegemony of the Catholic Church and its obsessive control over the bodies of, of women and children and the lies that kind of scuttled around um, that culture. Okay. And, but at the same time, Ireland's theocracy was so confident about its sovereignty in Irish political culture, that several referenda affirmed the power of the church. So two things converged. At the same time, as we are having in England, this conversation about Cleveland and se sexual abuse, and, da -da -da -da, okay? and the thing that converges is that Irish common sense and political culture is concerned with sex in a way that was absolutely unprecedented. And of course, one of the consequences of that was that even though the hegemony of the Catholic Church was secured in those referendums, it was also the moment of its undoing. Because Ireland now is a very different society from the Ireland of then. The same generation that protested and drew attention to those scandals is the generation that harvested the... The, the referendum on abortion, the referendum on um, gay rights, equal access to marriage, da, 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 da. So that's, it's now become a society which, despite the hegemony of the church, which is, well, then, it's a society that is well aware that the church has been the patron of patriarchal sexual abuse of women, children, men, everything, forever. So it's an extraordinary and emblematic poem. Okay, so I think we should have some contributions or questions from the floor. Really, really happy for you to, to speak and have things to say. It doesn't have to be a question. So maybe here and over there. Hi, both. Um, Liz, you may or may not remember, and I don't know about the... Um, that down in the south of England um, was a service that developed that early on, 85, 86, that um, provided group work for women survivors of uh, sexual abuse in mental health services, which worked for well, 30 plus years uphill, I might add, you know, pushing the wheelbarrow uphill. Um, and that group of women have actually stayed together. The, the, um, the, the therapists have stayed together, still working. Against the, the heaviness of the employer, I won't name them, um, NHS, I'll say that, um, uh, to not provide this service was intense. And I can remember reading your book, Liz, and thinking, oh my God, they've got our service written down. So it was amazing. We've had to, we had to work uphill all the time. But at that time, it was a case of like a bit of an early Me Too syndrome because we had lots of women coming saying, that happened to me, that happened to me. So we had lots. Um, so we persisted and carried on whatever the employer said. Um, but they have eventually, um, since the turn of the century, 
gradually managed to uh, stop that service by providing another service, um, which of course is not quite the same because it's not so expensive. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if you could comment on what I would see as the other victims of Cleveland, which were all the children who didn't get taken into care because of Cleveland, and where it feels like social services almost pivoted to the position of good enough parenting is the parents alive and breathing. That's good enough. great question because part of the ignition for the new book was that the generation of children who were children during the Cleveland controversy who mobilized against the churches who mobilized because of their experiences in children's homes in the wake of their experiences at the hands of people like Jimmy Savile Cyril Smith, what I, what I was very struck by was that the move, those movements, those survivors' movements, that created the imperative that could not be resisted any longer by Theresa May, she had to call a new independent inquiry into child sexual abuse. They were the children who, if you like, were the generation of children who were children during the era of the Cleveland controversy. Now, had, Cleveland, had the Cleveland controversy Cleveland Report done something different, their lives might have been different. For example, one of the things that the Cleveland Report insisted upon was that the relative autonomy of the police should be protected. So even though there was an expectation of collegial cooperation with other professions, the autonomy of the police would be preserved. Now we know what the consequences of that out. We knew what the consequences were actually during the Cleveland controversy. You know, there's an assumption that um, this was all about the family. Most of the children in the Cleveland cohort were indeed children who were living with their families. But there's another child, child C in the book, who was in a child, he was in residential care. The place that he was living in and being schooled in was a place that had, been, that had invited Jeff Wyatt to come and examine some children who were being sexually abused in that school. And he offered the school um, his attention. He offered to examine all of the children in the school, which would have been about 25 children. Not that many, actually. And this, <laughs> the response to this was complete horror. Well, one of the children who might have been examined was child C. And it was only when Charles C. left that school and began to tell his story that he was able to confront the institution with what he'd endured in that institution. Well, what, what it turned out to be was that there was a prolific abuser at work in that school who was only later, 10 years later, called to account after he'd gone back to Ireland. And Ireland was doing its excavation of mass abuse in its childcare institution. That man tried to get justice for another 20 years. He could have been a child whose story could have been told in the Cleveland Report. But what the Cleveland Report says is, well, um, things were resolved in that school. Well, they weren't resolved. It might well have been the case that all of the children in that school were being abused by somebody or other. I would have, think, I would have thought, actually, given what we know, that they were. So that, that generation of children became the children who made the demand that Theresa May could not resist for a new independent inquiry. Sadly, it didn't attract the kind of attention, the obsessive attention, that the Cleveland inquiry so. attracted, sad to say.
Yes, I can. Okay, we've got somebody here, and then there's somebody right at the back that I, I quite like. Hello. Um, to address your unanswered question about the publishers and why they were opposed to using the word cover-up, um, as soon as you said it, uh, the word collusion came to mind that you would be shining the light on, I think, collective collusion. Um, and the etymology, that is the meaning of the root word of collusion, is to come together to play. And so I think it's, again, a collective idea that you weren't just talking about Cleveland. It would be uncovering a mass collusion. Hi, um, I'm really glad you've mentioned the ICSA uh, report and inquiry. I had some personal and then professional contact with that. And I was really aware, so I would say as a survivor for me, going there, telling my story and being supported was really, really powerful. And the story I told was then taken up by the local police in Lancashire where I was a child and I was abused. But then what I was aware of was that when the report was published, which was, I think, September last year, it was at the time when this trust had crashed the economy and it got barely any traction in the media. And I'm conscious of how many, probably thousands of people told the stories, how many millions of pounds were spent and I'm wondering if, if either of you think that that report made any difference. Thank you. We both sighed at the same time, which gives you some idea of what we think. Um, I feel really complicated about the independent inquiry because I feel from the beginning it was set up not to know certain things. You will notice that there is, there's a missing institution, the family. There is no discussion of sexual abuse in the family. I think they found the idea of thinking about the family as an institution a bit too hard to bend their head around. But it's a case of, of things, people not linking things up, as B said earlier. We know that a significant proportion of sexual abuse happens in families. Why, why did we decide we only wanted to know about that that happened in institutions? So, so I, have, I have an ambivalence about it from the very beginning because I think it, it decided it, it wanted to narrow what it wanted to know. Um, so I'm not surprised in that sense. In one sense, I think it was a wish to open something up, a wish to create a space for people to tell their stories. Um, but I don't think they really knew what the Truth Project was supposed to do, what it was supposed to achieve. What, so, so, it, so it was kind of, it was kind of, if I'm being honest, I think it was performative rather than substance of, of that they, they wanted to know this about these things because they were going to move in this direction. I don't think there was any of that. It was just to do this thing because we need to. I agree. And I think that what we've got, nevertheless, what we've got is a huge archive of evidence of the experience of people who were, when they were children, denigrated terribly. There's a wonderful moment in the report on Nottingham children's homes where witness, I think I've got this right, witness, Judith, correct me if I'm wrong, is it witness D31? D31. It was Judith who was beloved over there, who was reading the Nottingham report, which is like the half dozen reports that were on 
particular locations, because the inquiry selected certain locations and certain modules. It didn't kind of scrutinize the world. And there's this woman who was the same age as Minnie, actually, when she was um, enduring all of this, same age now. And she tells her story, except she couldn't tell her story. So the lawyer representing the children ask, well, can I read your story? So she gives him permission to read her story to the inquiry. And her story is terrible. It's absolutely terrible. And yet this woman, imagine this, this is a woman who would just be regarded as, let's be honest, she'd be regarded as scum of the earth. Crap. And yet it's amazing, she gets the courage and the mental resort, I don't know where she got it from, to tell her story to these big people. And she's invited at the end, is there something else that you'd like to say? And she says, yes. So then she speaks, and she says words to the effect of, something has to get done about this, and get done now so as it doesn't happen to any more. Full stop. And it's one of those phrases, the punctuation is decisive. It's so eloquent. And it was resonant of a phrase that was used as it happens by Minnie in the first conversation that we ever had together, where she said to me, um, are there a few of us, comma, like me, chilling, unforgettable. That's one of the reasons why I think the, um, the independent inquiry was very important. People like Witness D31 could tell somebody and be taken seriously and be thanked for giving their <coughs> evidence. These are people who've been denigrated all their lives, many of whom just about managed to scramble survival. Okay, that's one thing, and I think we shouldn't underestimate that, and you can all read that testimony. It's all online, unlike the evidence in the Cleveland Inquiry. Unlike me. But, but, I think the panel completely lost confidence, and there'll be people who are closer to what the government was thinking at the time than I am. But I have a sense of them completely losing confidence, or maybe energy, because they had nothing to say, really, at the end of it all, about what is to be done. And I think, I think that is really, I think that's culpable, because what we know is, it's like climate change. You can't just tell people that things are terrible. There has to be a way of people being enabled to act upon what they know rather than feeling like shit, basically. So the knowledge has to become, has to be empowering. And that, I think, in the end, is the failure of the independent inquiry. But there are other people who might have a different thought. Sophie, for example. Do you want to say something, Sophie? She's there. Yes, I wanted to say something about the inquiry. Um, partly just to um, let women know you were saying that material's available, and it really is. And there was a, there was a report published. So they published the big report, unfortunately, on the day that the ridiculous Prime Minister resigned. But there was another report, which was the report of the Truth Project, which the research team produced. And there was no announcement when it went out I wrote a blog about it, actually, because, um, well, partly because the researchers told me this had gone on. I don't know why they did that, but, it, I mean, they could have had another go at kicking up proper fuss, which had, you know, really not happened. But anyway, it's, it's really worth reading, and those of you who contributed, I think it would be useful, you know, perhaps to have a look at the way they'd worked with the material because they're trying to think about the characteristics of abuse in different contexts, you know, from what they learned there. And there's also other very good research work 
um, st also still on that website. So, you know, it is worth looking for what you can make use of. Um, I work for the Centre of Expertise on Child Sexual Abuse, which relates to England and, and Wales. And I'd also like to recommend our stuff. And we've put together quite a lot of material trying to work out what truth there is that can be told, really. I mean, we've worked with Liz on a lot, trying to look at what is known about numbers a lot. What do we know and what don't we know about child sexual abuse? Also, there's a set of key messages from research, but there's also some practice materials. So those of you who are kind of in the business, there's a signs and indicators template tool which doesn't only look at the child, but looks at their context and any possible suspects. And there's a thing about communicating with children. It's just good stuff. Perhaps you can use it. The, the website, csacentre.org.uk. Okay, very good. Okay, Judith. Judith. I just wondered, B, if you ought to... Um, well, I'd like you to uh, perhaps say something a little bit more um, about the other side, the, the context for cover-up, uh, which, which was in the late 80s and 90s, and of course appears regu as regularly as the uh, information about sexual abuse appears. And, so, and what I'm talking about are uh, the sceptics, Peter Wilby, the backlash against child sexual abuse, against uh, rape, against anything to do with violence against women, and which is also, at the moment, appearing in the family courts uh, in relation to parental alienation. Yeah. I know that's a lot. You haven't got time, but I, do, I think it's important to expand that issue. Can we have this question here as well, and then we'll... Hi, thank you. Have you, you. Have you got a question too? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. I think it's, it's too early. You said we are, we've got all this information now. Those of us that are not professionals need some hope as well for what we can do about what's going on and what went on and the cover-up and everything. And the other thing, kind of related, is, is this a class issue? Because it seems to me those kids up in Cleveland, the poor kids, you know, girls being exploited in Rotherham and Rochdale and places like that. And there's this complete cover-up and not caring because these kids don't count anymore. They have no power. And, and you said you know, about the, the woman there, she's, she would be described as scum of the earth. That's exactly how these people probably regarded. And I think we lose sometimes, sorry, that class perspective and we need to kind of keep it in mind when we deal with it. And, and just the woman in the volunteer t-shirt. <laughs> um, hello, I just wanted to reassure you, I work in education safeguarding, um, that the ICSA report has been implemented immediately in all schools in England and really reflected upon with a view to protecting children um, especially with regard to low-level concerns, which we now have a, a duty to log as institutions and to reflect upon, um, because that was one of the findings that came out. It, it, these people could have been stopped if they'd been other people had been listened to earlier. So um, the, I don't think it was purely performative. I think it actually served a purpose for institutions, but that doesn't answer the question about family. Perhaps the scope was a bit too wide. Right, let's have a go at some of them. Um, this is obviously a conversation that's going to take, take us through the whole day. But anyway, um, okay, do this question about, well, first of all, I think that's great and that's really useful. And it may be modest, but it's useful. The question of the backlash, I think, is really, really hard. Really heavy and very hard. Because, first of all, Cleveland, I think, can be described as a backlash moment. The Cleveland report was a backlash report. It was animated by a backlash 
in the government, a government that, bear in mind, was led by Margaret Thatcher, who was not interested in child sexual abuse, who was rather tolerant of men who had a reputation for um, being dirty with boys. It was part of the kind of, you know, the cloistered culture of the class to which she then belonged. They expected people to be uh, sexually abused in their childhood. Um, but also, it was animated by a government that was absolutely resistant to the expansion of the welfare state and of social services. It was disrespectful of social services, public servants. It honoured the police, who it let off the hook, quite consciously, in the aftermath of the Cleveland report. The Cleveland report did it as well. And the other thing that was important about the, the establishment element of the backlash to what Cleveland could have told us was that it was perceived as Margaret Thatcher tells us in a gorgeous interview that my friend Fiona, who's here, alighted upon in minute 52. If you can bear it, it's really, really worth listening. She could bear it. I would have never have had the stamina to get to minute 52 of the recorded interview uh, with uh, Elizabeth Butler-Sloss conducted at the Gresham College, legal college. You just have to Google it and you'll find it. Like Fiona did and she persisted, which I wouldn't have done. But anyway, when you get to you know, minute 52, she is asked uh, 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 about her appoint how she was appointed. And she says in her gorgeously establishment way, well, uh, you know, I can't do the accent, I wish I could. Um, but that they, uh, they thought that this was, that to put a stop to this, this was a kind of women against men thing going on in Cleveland, when in fact, of course, what was happening was a men against women thing. It was thoroughly gendered, but not in the way that she thought it was. And therefore, they should have a, women, a woman judge. And as she puts it in that marvelous establishment, self-effacing way, well, there were only three of us, and I think two of them were on holiday, so there was only me. <laughs> and so she gets appointed. As it happens, she's the sister of the Attorney General. Um, and it was, and that was animating belief. When you read the Cleveland report, you can see that it infuses the way that they thought about the professionals. Indeed, the person who was the counsel to the inquiry, in other words, the person who's orchestrating the witnesses and the way that they're going to be questioned, he believed, and he's explicit about it, he believed that there was a kind of coven of women professionals who conferred, conferred, therefore conspired, colluded with each other, against whom these men who had not been on courses were, of course, hapless. So, gender infuses the report. But back to your thing about the backlash. The Cleveland report has to be seen as not what it was described as at the time, magisterial. It has to be seen as a backlash document. The only international witness who was invited to the inquiry is a man called Ralph Underwager, who was a crusader against children's evidence of sexual abuse in the courts in the United States. He always represented the defendants, the men. He then becomes an ardent advocate of adult women who are making allegations of childhood sexual abuse that becomes, you'll remember this, those of you of a certain age, the false memory movement. The only person, the only international witness to the Cleveland inquiry. And the response of the majority of the press to the Cleveland report was a classic example of the kind of skepticism that needs a bit of explanation. I think a lot of us would want to be thought of as not believers, but thoughtful, skeptical people come at stuff with questioning minds. What I learned from thinking about the Cleveland case was that here you'd got a, a, a commentariat who felt absolutely confident in their resistance to, to what might have been being put before them. 
and what was being put before them was a demand to hear about the suffering of children and do something about it. It's very simple. But they decided to not hear that and not do something about it. So scepticism is always politically motivated. It's always about a refusal to empathise and to think and then answer that demand. And here we are again in the family courts when children make allegations of child sexual abuse that are honoured by their mothers, and sometimes they're not, but if they are, then the answer to that now routinely in the family courts is these mothers are alienating their children from their fathers. And there's an injunction, an informal injunction, uh, that of course children must see their fathers. Therefore, these allegations of child sexual abuse are being manufactured by malign mothers. Here we go again. And the person who invented that theory is none other than Richard S. Gardner, who was a great pal of aforementioned Ralph Underwager, who gave evidence to the Cleveland Inquiry. They, they don't stop. And as long as, you, as long as we live long enough, we can remember some of these names, of these codgers who were so dangerous. This thing um, about parental alienation, children who've been induced, children who've been brainwashed, it's exactly the same language as was being used in the era of the Cleveland Inquiry. It's a terribly dangerous moment. Time's up, folks. <laughs> <laughs>